Hello, everybody, and welcome to another story time video. If you don't know what these are, basically, I'm just telling the stories of what has happened in our Star Wars tabletop uh, RPG game before our series launches later in this fall. Uh, if you haven't already, I had recently put up a video, so go check it out, uh, talking about how you can get kind of an, an early access to our series for this um, by being privately invited to kind of sit in on one of our games before we launch the series. Uh, and that way you kind of get to see it played and see how the series is going to go and um, get to meet the players and everything like that. With that said, we last left off telling the story of kind of the final part of Dathomir, uh, where the players had just escaped after causing a giant creature to attack uh, a Knight Brothers stronghold. The players got some prisoners out, got to their ship well, by having their ship fly to them, um, flew back to kind of their original landing spot and decided now was the time to make their move on this this stronghold of the Night Sisters because most people would be occupied at the moment with uh, the crazy amount of chaos that was happening in this camp in the northwest. So they land their ship. They basically tell everybody, hey, you're going to be safe here. Don't leave the ship. We'll be right back. Uh, and they take off towards the north. And it does take them quite some time, you know, to get to get up there because they are once again traversing a a swampland. Um, it's not easy to rain and it takes them a few hours to kind of work their way north until they get to a part of the marsh that is very spooky and creepy and even more so than the rest of it because they're looking down and they start seeing bodies and these are like dead bodies, like long dead where there are bones and stuff in the, the, the swampland and then a random arm kind of pops out of the the water and tries to grab onto one of them and they manage to get away but this is an occurrence that happens several times as they move throughout this part of the swamp and what this is if you actually watch the clone war series um I got the inspiration from this because the Night Sisters, at one point, they they fight the separatist army. So the, the droids show up and they fight the Night Sisters, and there's a huge loss of life. But at one point, the main kind of uh, leader, and I'm, I'm trying to keep this fairly vague in case you haven't watched Clone Wars. You should. It's pretty good. Um, the main leader resurrects a ton of people who had died previously and, like, in, you know, that creepy horror movie zombie way where they, like, run up walls, but they're using, like, all four of their, you know, arms, and then they do, like, that, that almost like the frames are missing there, so it kind of moves creepily. Uh, that's what she does. She summons a ton of those out of these giant, like, hanging sacks that are hanging off, like, mushrooms and trees and stuff in the swamp, and uh, they go and they fight the droid army, and, again, loss of life is, is fairly great there. But uh, the idea behind this part of the swamp was that it was going to be a little bit of an obstacle. I kind of had the players bypass this, and this is a little bit of a GM tip. If you feel like things are taking too long and they're dragging a bit, and in this case I did, because as I explained in the last episode, one of the players like straight up, uh, actually a couple of them straight up just said like, this is taking too long. Why are we even here? Like they, they just told me straight out like this is this feels useless to us. Why are we here? And with that in mind, because there was a break in between sessions, I was like, okay, well, this part of the game, I'll, I'll, I had laid this out as a potential thing, but I decided to let them be able to bypass most of it just for the sake of getting through the rest of Dathomir. So they do, they get past uh, this part of the swamp and they come up to this a little out of place mountainside. Uh, it's, it's fairly small. It's not like a, like a huge mountain range. It's just like a singular um, mountain in the, the middle of the swamp, which is spooky already by itself. Uh, not to mention the fact that it has these ruins carved into it, kind of, kind of like a tomb carved into it. And, they the players they they scout it out and they see a lot of night sisters kind of moving in and out and being on guard and it's at this point that uh venator finally manages to make a successful check 
uh, perception check and finally sees that, yeah, there is someone following them, someone kind of spookily following them in the marsh. Um, you can't make out who it is, but they can tell that they're very athletic because they're jumping between the trees and stuff. Um, so the players are feeling like, okay, they, they probably know we're here or know we're coming, but that person that they, they found following them and has been following them the entire time they've on, been on Dathomir, um, hasn't gone to the night sisters. It, it has gone a different direction. You would ex- assume that if this person is following him and would alert the night sisters of their presence, they would head in that direction, but it doesn't. Um, so the players feel kind of confident that they're still have some element of surprise, but they want to go in to a different direction. So they work their way around the side of this mountain, hopefully finding a, a cave entrance or something to get them in. They do find a cave and they work their way in um, and, and they kind of like work their way down this cave. And it has a similar uh, similar feel to the one that Doc had gone into to get his new powers and did all the visions and stuff where they're going down the sides or they're going down the cave and the sides of this cave have this green liquid flowing through it. And it's, it's kind of like uh, illuminating the cave itself in this creepy green way. But the, the water is on the ground on the sides of it, like flowing um, in a very small stream. So, you know, the middle of the, the cave is, is, a little damp and stuff, but it's elevated a bit. Whereas the sides near the walls are lowered because of this water trickling through it. That's kind of carved its own way uh, down through this cave system. And they work their way down for a few minutes before they uh, get to a large open cavern. And there is seemingly no way out. And it goes up like a good 30 feet before in the middle of the ceiling, there seems to be like this metal grate in the ceiling and light is shining down through it. And the players are just like, well, this is clearly a dead end. There's actually no way out of here. Uh, and there was no other pathway they saw coming down this this cave. But when they, they kind of like quiet because they hear a couple noises coming from above them. So all of them kind of shush up and, and listen in. And they hear a conversation uh, between a couple of women and a man, ha- uh, a man, not a man, happen as I go through my notes. Because I do have a lot of the dialogue written down that is important for the characters to overhear. And again, that's another GM tip uh, for any of you. If, you. if you want dialogue to stick uh, that the players are going to either overhear or hear themselves through a NPC, just write it down. It actually uh, does help a lot. But what they hear is they hear one woman say... Um, and very quietly because it is pretty high up and they feel like they are being pretty secretive, you know, by sneaking through here. They don't think they've been seen um, or heard. And they hear one woman say that uh, I, I, I say we just kill them all and be done with it. To be honest, the things creep me out. And another woman replies with like, I totally agree. They serve no purpose other than entertainment for Mother Taylouse. And then they hear a man say, well, then why not just tell her to stop? And then the they bo- both the women crack up laughing at them, like cackling almost, like you're an idiot. And then one woman actually does end up responding after a couple of seconds of, because nobody dares defy her, lest they end up like the Wookiees. And it's at this point that the, the ears perk on all the players are like, okay, well... We were here to find the Wookiees, but they heard from a Knight Brother scout earlier that the Wookiees were all dead, or at least he assumed they were all dead. And, you know, they're they're feeling pretty down at this point. Like, okay, well, maybe we can find Cookie's father, but likely going to be a body at this point. But if we can recover the body, then that's good enough for Cookie, even though it's very devastating. So they... they seemingly having no place to go uh start working their way out of a cave when they hear a voice come from outside of the cave kind of echoing down which is uh it's it's almost like an ethereal voice as it it doesn't sound you know normal like a normal echo would echo and ring throughout the cave but this sounds more like um it's it's reverberating from the voice itself and not necessarily from the cave and what they hear is a voice say, what you seek is not down there, come to me. 
And they're like, well, that was an obvious, you know, obviously Zen set that up as a way to kind of lead them forward. And I did, uh, but I wanted them to overhear that conversation because it, that, I think that was going to be something that put them in the right uh, mindset going forward here. But they end up working their way out of the cave. Uh, they get to the the mouth of the cave and they see kind of a, a, a form of a woman. And as they get closer, they see that it is incorporeal. Like it looks like a... A, a person right it looks like a person but they can like see through it almost um not like a force ghost but more like a kind of creepy ghost that is half tied to this world and they pretty much and this it, it's a little funny but at the same time i think it's a really good uh lesson to be learned here is the player's in particular, the one that does most of the talking was so fed up with being on this planet that he decided this, whatever this is, it matters not. We just need to get this freaking, we need to get Cookie's father and get out of here. So the players uh, almost shrug everything off that this woman is about to say. Um, she basically starts telling them like, hey, I will lead you to the correct entrance. I see you sneaking around here, but I need your help. And they're, you know, they, they're like, okay, what is it? And she's like, I need you to kill uh, Mother Tay Luce. And they're like, okay, whatever. Yeah, we were going to do that anyways. Lead us on. And they just like don't care of anything that she has to say, which is unfortunate because uh, I did a really cool story bit here where, and, you know, sometimes this happens. And as a GM, you just got to shrug it off. You know, sometimes the players aren't interested. And if they aren't, don't take it personally. And I didn't. Um, but I think it would be really cool for you guys to at least know where in the Clone Wars series, going back to that, and again, I've kind of modeled this entire planet off of what is shown in that series because it's really the only bit of Dathomir we ever really see in the Star Wars universe. But uh, at the very kind of end of the Dathomir stuff, Ventress, who is one of the main Night Sisters, who turns bounty hunter and fights like Obi Wan, and then fights with Obi Wan, and then uh, is allies with um, <laughs> with the resurrected. I would say not necessarily, but more like um, rejuvenated body, half half man, half machine of Darth Maul, and then his brother, and then. They end up kind of going crazy, so she's out for herself, and then she fights with Obi-Wan to fight them. Anyway, she's a pretty important person, Ventress is, and she ends up uh, falling uh, kind of in the midst of a battle at one point, and she dies. So with that, I was like, okay, wh why does this character necessarily, why does that story have to end there? And I don't think it... It necessarily would if they ever revisited this, you know, this plot line that happened on Dathomir during the Clone Wars. Um, I feel like she was very proud of her people in a very specific way, not necessarily for who her people were, but for who she was in particular. And I feel like Ventress also would have wanted the the Night Sisters to remain a very proud yet small group of people and if anyone had ever betrayed the memory of the night sisters um she she would kind of be bound to that and want to change that despite being dead uh, and and a lot of this stems from the fact that the night sisters again they don't really use the force technically they use what people describes uh, describe of magics and it's force like, but it's it is you know semi different because their powers are granted to them from the sleeper. So one could assume, and this is again all stuff that I kind of came up with that this because the sleeper is a very powerful creature on Dathomir, and the Dathomir waters have rejuvenating properties, which are why you know some of those corpses that I put in that swamp are still whole and not necessarily completely you know rotten by now. Because we're in the Force Awakens timeline, yet this, this all happened during the Clone Wars. So one could also, you know, put together that Ventress, while she died here, 
um, may still be bound to this planet somehow, whether it be through the sleeper or not. And my whole idea here, my whole pr plot was that she was going to want to overthrow and help the players um, overthrow Mother Talus, who is a night sister who came up and basically started doing atrocities to uh, people, to outsiders in the in in a way that uh, shames the the night sisters as a whole. And Ventress wouldn't want that. Ventress would want you know her people to be proud whatever is left of them and if if that can't happen then for none of her people to be around at all because then it's just tainting the memory so that was the idea there and what ends up happening is alask just walks up is like who are you okay i don't really care you want to take us to the right place cool let's do that and in that moment i like I had to kind of think on my feet, like, what would she feel like in this moment? Well, she would feel kind of put off, I would say, because she's seen, you know, the, the players at work and assumed that they would help her um, because, you know, there is an atrocity going on here. They seem to want to end this atrocity. So, you know, their, their wants and desires aligned in that sense. That being said, they didn't want to be on this planet anymore. So... She kind of felt that and she just says, okay, whatever. And what ended up happening is she would have helped the players in an inevitable fight uh, in the near future and instead decides if the players, you know, if the party wants to go and do this themselves and doesn't really care about the plights of my people, then so be it. Uh, at least they take down Mother Tay Luce, right? So what ends up happening she leads them to the cave. They go in it. They start exploring. Uh, there's many branching paths. It's It narrows. It widens. There's a lot of stuff in here that is uh, fairly, you know, it's, it's a lot of dead ends and fairly useless. But they, they find a couple caverns that are really interesting. The first one is a, is a very big cavern that empties into a pool of water just like the one that the sleeper was in, except much smaller. And Doc, played by Six Pounder, who had just shown up, he, he was late for that session, he had just shown up at that moment when they're walking into there, and he's like, nope, 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 you guys got to get out of there, do not be in there, leave now. Um, so all of the players, in a hurry, leave that cavern, which is good because maybe they would have encountered the sleeper, maybe not, who knows. It probably would have ended badly for them, though. And then they find another small cavern that looks like it had uh, a fire in it. It looks like there's a couple pieces, like like boxes that had equipment in them. So they kind of start scavenging around in here, being like, what the heck is this? What's going on? And the boxes have the Safira Hunter logo on them. And that piques their interest, of course, for several reasons, including the fact that they're looking for Lily, who is the the sister of Caitlin, one of their friends, and is kind of the um, secretary to this bounty hunter they're working for for the Great Hunt. And then, uh, you know, aside from that, they just saved a ton of Saphira hunters as well. So their interest is immediately piqued. They start looking around. They find a blaster that looks like it's been fired. Um, they see a couple blaster marks on the wall and then Gand finds a small book and picks it up and starts flipping through it, which is really funny because Al ask in this moment, he sees the camp and just shrugs it off and goes whatever and starts walking away as Gand picks up this book and starts looking through it and finds some very interesting information that he decides then not to share with the rest of the party at the moment because they clearly are in a, uh, like in a hurry, whereas Gand is, sees this, recognizes this as something important, and sits down and reads through uh, this little journal. And as I flip through my page and my notes, I, I had a lot of information in this journal that I think one of them, at the very least, would have found interesting. And indeed, it was Gand, which uh, he kind of flips to the end, tries to find the last journal entry, and he does. Um, which basically ends with Lily, because it's a Lily's journal, uh, ends with her talking about how she managed to escape during the uh, the ambush that happened with the Knight Brothers and is detailing all of this stuff there. Then 
she also writes down how the Knight brothers wanted to capture her for a client, and she overheard them saying that she needs to come in alive in particular, like the other ones can die, but she needs to live so they can hand her over. Um, and that the entire hunt for the Torrent attack that the Sephira hunters were doing was a setup. Uh, they were brought to this planet as a setup for them to capture Lily. And then finally, she has a note for her sister kind of written at the bottom of this, which is that, you know, Caitlin, if if you find this, warn the other hunters because we are now being hunted. And then again, the, the gun there is basically just relevant because she found a gun on one of the bodies uh, out front of this this cave and she was using it to defend herself but then after a little bit of investigation gand realizes that she was taken uh, in her sleep so she had escaped and managed to find her way into this cave set up a little shelter wrote some things down in case this stuff was either ever found and she didn't get away and then when she fell asleep the Knight Brothers tracked her here and then found her and took her. So all of this was actually really uh, important information that, again, one of the players, just because of his impetus to leave this place as soon as possible, would have completely skipped. Thankfully, Gand, you know, took the time to look through it and read all this stuff, and I sent it to him privately. And it's something that I do uh, a lot now in my game where I'll take a player, because, you know, we were on Discord. If we were in... Uh, in person with each other, I would take them into a different room and then, you know, show them this stuff or text it to them, like have it prepared and then just text it to them as a, you know, private thing. Because I think the obscuring of information is really kind of fun in a game uh, played with other players who are playing cooperatively. But sometimes there's information there that that player would not want to share with the other players. Was there anything in this journal that necessarily would be like that? No, but I find it uh, fascinating if the players ever do obscure information. So I did take him aside and I told him all of this stuff in the journal. And then we you know, got back into the game. The other players were anxious to move on. So we did. And he held that um, held that against his chest for the time being. He later ends up telling the players when they get back to their ship. But uh, at this point, they they have no idea that this stuff was from Lily. He he does mention it briefly that this was a Lily's camp. And um, when they're there, they do end up finding uh, another uh, pistol just kind of nearby. And it ends up being a an item that I had set aside for Alask as like a magical item almost. Kind of a, a pair to another pistol he found earlier. So now he has kind of his set pistols. Um, that I made specifically for his character. And again, he would have completely gone right past it, which is fine. You know, if you set an item in front of a player and they go past it and you don't ever get the chance to give it to them, then you can take that same item, they'll never know, and just put it somewhere else too. Uh, but they do end up finding it because Gand, again, is kind of looking around. Um, that said, they move on through the caves and they they find a lot of dead ends once again. Uh, but they end up finding a kind of caved in area and they go to it. They move some of the rocks out of the way and they're able to peer through and they see a patrol walk by a night sister patrol. And they're like, OK, well, I think we found the correct way to go. Um, and there's just enough room kind of on the top of this cave in for them to all get through sneakily not necessarily they were, they were all going to have to make stealth rolls to get through here and they mostly succeeded with one fail and how i do that is i do kind of a group stealth roll so everybody has to roll especially if they're together have to roll a stealth roll and then if a majority of them succeed then it succeeds if a majority of them fail then it fails and one player of all of them failed and one of the rocks starts kind of like tumbling down out through the top of this cave in making a lot of noise before one of the players uh, expertly catches it. Uh, so that's kind of narratively how I, how I have that work. But because of the star Wars dice roll system, you can make it. So like, you know, what if they all succeeded on their stealth check, but there's a ton of disadvantage that comes with that uh, through their roles or a ton of advantage. Well, then you can make it. So either they are able to 
be you know stealthed longer or that a, a ton of noise is made and while they remain you know hidden maybe one of the patrols is alerted to kind of come over and look if there was a lot of disadvantage so there's stuff that you could do with that narratively uh, that wasn't the case here it was just uh, a little flare on that so they get through they're now in kind of a main hallway is what it appears to be and they work their way through uh, into a room that they open up and there's two night sisters and a night brother that they start uh, fighting immediately they're trying to take them down quietly but just in case they they close the door behind them um, and they're in kind of like a large almost carved out central chamber that even has pillars in it so it looks like Whoever did this is like they they live here, so they made this cave whatever home they could. And on the ground is a giant uh, grate, and they're able to kind of piece together that these were the people that they heard talking earlier, and this was the room that they were below. Uh, After dealing with these people, even though they did quite a bit of damage to the players, which I wanted them to do, I wanted them to kind of weaken the players for this final fight, so the fight would be you know, a little bit more dangerous to them. And they knew that going in. Um, so they, they do this fight, they move on, they find a couple like weird chambers, like really creepy chambers where there's sacrifice stones and there's like bodies of people who have sacrificed themselves next to these stones. Uh, they go through and eventually the cave opens up into kind of a larger cavern where there's a lot of that water uh, that I mentioned earlier on the, the the sides of the cave, like really illuminating it. And the water, instead of pooling kind of on the sides, also trickles through a little bit uh, this cavern. So uh, the ground in between that they're walking on is illuminated by this as well. So they start walking into this cave sneakily. And on the far end of it, they see a woman near kind of like a like an alchemy station you know there's a ton of like jars and stuff and weird colors of liquid in these jars and she's faced away from the players so she doesn't see them and then as they get closer they they see a wookie kind of in between them and this woman and the wookie looks he's turned around so it's kind of hard to see what's going on and the players like slowly creep up on him and cookie being the one who's you know most at risk here because he's trying to find his father and there's something familiar about this wookie and he puts his hand on this wookie's shoulder and turns him around and the the eyes of this wookie are just like bloodshot and he looks feral and he bites cookie just like straight up bites him and then starts freaking out which alerts the woman and then behind them out of the water climbs three uh undead wookies and this is actually this is a weird thing about the Star Wars universe is, you know, aside from raccoons, there are more undead creatures that you find in the lore, including like straight up zombie Wookiees. And that's what ends up happening here. Three of them get up out of the water and they start uh, moving their way towards the players, which are now uh, basically locked in this room because you have these undead Wookiees walking at them. One of them is crawling at them from where they just came, so they're kind of blocked off. Then they have this feral Wookiee next to Cookie, and then they have this woman on the other side that is now alerted and cackling creepily. And it's at this point that something is familiar in in all of this situation to Doc, and he's kind of looking around and he's going, like, I don't... I feel like this is kind of like that vision that I had, but like something is very familiar about it, but I can't put a finger on it. So the players turn around, uh, combat is initiated. They swiftly take the, the zombie Wookiees out by actually throwing a little explosive down, which is a clever way of taking care of them. I didn't, I didn't consider that. And I like when that happens in the game where the players do an action that I wasn't considering because to me, uh, that's kind of the fun of the game is when they get creative with really cool stuff. So they do that. They turn and they try to subdue the feral Wookiee, which at this point, now that Cookie has had a chance to kind of gain his composure, is able to identify this as his father. Um, they they pretty much set all their weapons to stun 
and subdue him as quickly as possible before charging this woman who hadn't really gotten a chance to attack at this point because they did this all within like a single round of combat. And finally it gets to her and she does some pretty spooky stuff. I gave her a lot of really cool abilities, one of which was um, kind of like a lightning rod where she she kind of casts an ability, um, something that the players have never seen before because, again, Night Sisters have magics um, on a player and that player takes you know, a very specific set of damage. And then all players around him within 10 feet also take a very specific set of damage. And basically the mechanic behind it is that player needs to move away from all other players, um, which you can do effectively in the combat system for Star Wars. Because when you roll initiative and you're doing combat, um, it's turn-based, but all of the player slots are considered a PC slot. It's a it's a player slot. It's not like a cookie, you know, cookie has his own slot and then Al asks his his. What it is is all of the players get to decide in that combat round who is going when and they can strategically set up people to go first and people to go last to do certain actions. And the the NPCs sometimes have stuff like that. Other times... If they're just like minions, they all kind of go at once. So there's some interesting, weird, cool things that can happen in combat with that that can't necessarily happen in D&D because D&D is a little bit more rigid uh, when it comes to turn-based combat. Um, but with that said, they manage to move the person away. They figure out the mechanic fairly easily. And throughout the course of the battle, the person who they identify as Mother... Uh, Tay, whatever her name is. I don't even remember. The, it, I remember it starts with Tay. Tay Luce. There we go. Not a memorable character because I literally had no chance to uh, build her up as a character because I wanted, to, at this point, to get the players off the planet. And I know I keep mentioning that because I think it's a it's an important through line for the the plot of what ends up happening here. But she tries to mind control some of them. That doesn't really happen uh, they she she actually does mind control one of them, but they manage or manage to break free of it almost immediately, um, and they it kind of is this quick back and forth where some of the players get pretty low on HP with the, this fight. So it was a dangerous fight, but they managed to take her out. And then what is left is this like alchemy table behind her with very specific colors of vials on it. And then this unconscious Wookiee that they just knocked out. And then it, it hits Doc like, oh crap, this is exactly my vision. And he has to confess to the party, I know which of the, these vials to use. And they're like, you said to use the green one, right? or that you said to use the red one, right? Like, that was the one that you used and that saved the Wookiee in, in your vision when you told us about it. And he was like, uh, yeah, in my vision, he died. I lied to you guys. But uh, the correct one to use is actually the blue one. So they end up kind of going back and forth uh, with a little bit of an argument here. Like, not necessarily how could you lie to us, but wait, why didn't you tell us the truth there? Okay, whatever. It doesn't really matter. We need to save him because we just made a ton of noise. They give the they they give the Wookiee the the serum that is assumed to be the correct one, and he doesn't immediately die, but he is unconscious. So Cookie picks up his father, puts him over his shoulder, and they start booking it out. And they are basically running for their lives. They come, they go back out the same way they came in, and they hear many footsteps behind them, um, pretty far behind them, but they seem to be catching at a a pretty serious rate so they're just booking it out as quickly as possible they make it outside the cave and they start running down this mountainside and by the time they kind of get about halfway down they turn around and there's a ton of people behind them following them and not just not just like normal um like night sisters and night brothers but also some of those undead night sisters that i talked about earlier they run down the mountain. They go to get on the comms to tell Gideon to get the ship over here, which is their ship AI. And by the time they even get on the comms to do that, the ship is just in front of them. It just shoots across the sky, gets in front of them and gets down. And uh, Gideon tells them that he was listening to the entire uh, ordeal and decided to come and save them. 
and they they jump onto the ramp of the ship uh, as the the ramp closes behind them as they run up, and they basically are safe on the ship as the ship goes into orbit and prepares to make a uh, a hyperspace jump depending on where the players want to go, and it's it's there that will end our story time here. Because the next bit, they end up going back to Ordmantel, and that's kind of where our story is at currently. But I feel like I I wanted to give a lot of information in these story times, like a lot of like detail that probably didn't need to be there. But I wanted to do it as a learning tool to show you that there was a lot of content on Dathomir, and they did spend several weeks here. But I think in the end to the players it felt like none of this was relevant content like they could have found cookie's father on any planet and it didn't have to necessarily have this much stuff here um and they also didn't really find lily they found some evidence that she was here but she was taken and you know taken somewhere else which is kind of stuff that they already knew was that she necessarily wasn't here but they might have found information about her which they did so I think in hindsight, I'll put more or I'll put better content on a planet um, and have it more tightly packed rather than a lot of stuff that that feels useless to the players. Um, That is a, a lesson that I learned and... It's definitely something to keep an an eye out for if you're making your own content in your games Um, because, you know, the players want to feel like they're making progress. And while they were making plenty of progress in that scenario, it just didn't feel like meaningful progress. So I think in the future, I'm going to have to come up with better ways to do that. And I I have, and you'll see that in the next story time when they get back to Ord Mantel and they, they figure out how to... Uh, deal with Cookie's father and they get a very important bounty that comes in um, that scares the players but we'll talk about that all in the next story time video so with all of that being said we shall see you guys next time